Now that Intel has released the core architecture in 2006, starting with the Core 2 brand and leading up to the Skylake microarchitecture under the Core i series of brand, the focus on IPC and other technological gains over clock speeds have become strikingly apparent. Looking at a typical Intel quad-core processor at the 90-ish watt TDP mark, in the last 10 years there have only been a clock speed increase of about 1.4 GHz looking at base-to-base -base clocks, or 1.6 GHz looking at base-to-all-core boost clocks. That's 140 to 160 MHz per year. Let's take the midpoint and call it a 150 MHz increase per year, on average. If we compare the Q6600 to the i5-6600, we will see that in the last 10 years, clocks have increased by just over 64%. That is, we haven't even approached a doubling in clock speed in the case of these two processors. Although looking at the i7-7700K, clocks have increased by 200MHz per year if we're looking at the i7-7700K's all-car turbo, that's about an 83% increase in clocks in a span of 10 years. To compare the difference in architectures from the beginning of the IPC war to now, I will be looking at per clock performance of the Core 2 Quad Q9450, Q9500 and the Skylake i5-6600. However, the Core 2 Quad and i5 clock for clock, car for car and even cache for cache don't have the same performance. That's at 4GHz on 4 cars with 6 megs of cache. In this test I went on the HWBot website and found GPU Pi 1 billion scores for the i5-6600 at 4GHz, so essentially a 7600, and a Core 2 Quad Q9450 also at 4GHz. There's also a Q9500 at just over 4GHz to get data on the cache for cache differences. This makes it a fantastic comparison of the work per clock that each CPU can do. As you can see the Q9400 completes its calculation in 12 minutes 30, or about 756 seconds, whereas the i5 completes its calculation in 10 minutes 30 ish, or about 628 seconds. That's a whopping IPC increase of 20% in 10 years. Okay, so we have 20% to clocks and we get an equivalent performance increase of about 180 MHz per year, which seems quite disappointing. This may seem low, and that's okay. This is due to the workload that these CPUs are under. I feel like there is no such thing as a representative workload so often touted by tech enthusiasts because some people mean games, some mean data sorting and some mean number crunching and all these workloads vary in their behaviours wildly. GPU Pi is an example of a very heavy and linear integer workload. GPU Pi will fully utilise the CPU's ALUs and won't really tax any other part of the CPU. The programme is very linear and very taxing on the ALUs. What I mean by linear is the program flow is very predictable, there are relatively few random jump instructions and so it doesn't take advantage of extremely effective branch prediction, nor does it seem to favour large caches as shown by the Core 2 vs Skylake, where one of the CPUs had twice the cache as the i5 and other Core 2 and there was negligible effects. So the question remains, what causes the IPC gains then? Well I'll cover that a little later when we get into more technical details as I want to cover the different types of IPC gains first when we start looking at the changes in the microarchitectures. Looking at the same CPUs, the same actual CPUs for the most part, when it came down to Cinebench R15, this is a different type of workload to before. It's a rendering benchmark which requires large streams of data from higher memory and is also very likely able to exploit vector processing so it taxes the CPUs VPUs also branch prediction and AGUs as a result of higher memory accesses. However, one type of workload that Cinebench will not test is a CPU's integer performance. Therefore, any advantage Skylake has in the ints will not be exposed here. Just keep that in mind. Anyway, let's get on to the scores. The i5 at 3.9 GHz got a score of 641. That's 164 points per GHz. Then the Q9450 got 447 at 4.1 GHz for 109 points per gigahertz and the Q9500 got 442 points at 4.15 gigahertz for 106.5 points per gigahertz. This shows how the Core 2 CPUs have around the same performance, however the Skylake i5 managed to get a 50% increase in clock for clock performance. Looking at the next benchmark, Geekbench Single Core. This benchmark stresses most elements of the CPU including the ALUs for integers, FPs for floats, AGs for memory accesses, and likely VPUs for vector processing. The i5 gets 1265 points per gigahertz, the Q9450 gets 592 points per gigahertz, and the Q9500 gets 614 points per gigahertz. Here it seems clock for clock, 
car for car, Skylake gets about twice the performance as the car 2 CPUs, and as this workload tests near everything the microarchitecture has to offer, then we could say here that Skylake has twice the IPC as its great ancestor, the car 2 microarchitecture. Just for fun, I wanted to see how Ryzen compares against Skylake, as Ryzen is typically seen as a weaker architecture to Skylake, and is often touted as a more comparable architecture to Haswell. So I set up my 1700X to run at 4GHz on 4 cars with SMT disabled, and memory running at 2933 megatransfers per second. Unfortunately, the cache difference still remained, and I ran with a full 16 megs of L3 cache and 2 megs of L2 cache. However, we have seen little difference in the cache makes in this bench, so I wasn't too concerned that it will skew the results. Speaking of results, they were interesting. I managed to beat the Skylake CPU by over a minute, scoring 9 minutes 12 seconds. This was a shocker as I really couldn't fully trust the results, so I benched it a further 3 times. I got 2 benches in the region of 9 minutes 40ish, and 1 at about 10 minutes. Either way, in every single run I beat Skylake, and what's more interesting is that when I ran a Geekbench test to compare my CPU to Skylake, my CPU got beaten consistently. Next I brought in Cinebench R15, where I got beaten by about 5% when compared to Skylake. The differences here are interesting, but looking at Ryzen in depth isn't the point of this video, so I'm not going to be spending much time looking at this in more depth now. Now let's look at the changes in the microarchitectures throughout the years that have driven these IPC increases. Starting with the Core 2 microarchitecture, it had 11 execution units. Three of those are related to memory accesses, which in the case of GPU Pi won't have a massive effect as we have already discussed. This leaves 9 other execution units to look at, but unfortunately, the diagrams I have aren't too clear on what each one does. From what I can gather, there are 3 or 4 simple integer ALUs and 2 FPUs. The other ALUs do work like SSE extensions. One of the FPUs is capable of multiplication and division, and the other FPU, addition and by virtue of this is also able to do subtraction because of 2's complement binary signature, although I'm not going into that now. What this means is that the processor is able to work on say float addition and multiplication at the same time. Not only that, but the FPU is 128 bits wide, meaning that the FPU can do two double precision operations in one go, four single propositions, or eight half precision operations. Now looking at the ALUs, as that's what mainly influences GPU Pi, it looks like there are three ALUs, each one will be 64 bits wide. That's double precision if we look on the GPU Pi website, they state that the application runs mostly double precision integer addition per batch, in which the results are divided by double precision and stored as a 128 bit integer. Now if we look at the algorithm to calculate the digit of pi, we can see that there are indeed a lot of addition, subtraction, multiplication and division per batch, therefore executing just one instance of this formula is going to hit the ALUs more than anything else. Also, as there is only one variable, k, which is the digit of pi being calculated, the register usage and memory access are going to be limited, which shows why the larger cache has seemingly no effect on the CPU's performance. So now we know where the Core 2's performance has come from, we need to find out where the Skylake's IPC advantage is coming from, and to understand that, we need to look at what has changed between Core 2 and Skylake. So let's begin with the end of Core 2, as we have already covered that. The Core 2 microarchitecture was a bit of a stopgap for Intel as the netburst architecture had failed, and as I said in the last video, Intel had dropped quite a few of the technological improvements made in netburst, such as hyperthreading and the decoded microinstruction cache. However, new technologies did come with this architecture, such as macro-op fusion, similar to, but different from, micro-op fusion that came with the P6. Maybe something for a different video. Anyway, two years after the release of Core 2, Intel was now ready to release its next generation of car architecture, branded under the Core i series, starting with Nahalem in 2008. Nahalem was really the merging of the technologies of the Pentium 4 and the Core 2 microarchitecture. The car stayed mostly the same as from Core 2, and as such, clock for clock, thread for thread, Nahalem provides almost identical performance to a Core 2 CPU with the same config. Now I said thread for thread because hyperthreading was reintroduced. The pipeline grew in length to about the same length as the Pentium 4s, and the branch prediction was further improved, however there were no major developments to the car. The major changes came to the CPU's uncore. The interface to the CPU was changed, the front side bus and back side bus was removed. 
the QPI interface replaced the frontside bus and a new car and cash interface was implemented, the legendary ring bus that suddenly became a popular topic recently as it had limited Intel's ability to scale car counts up. It was replaced in Skylake Hex with their mesh interface, which is likely a cross bar like AMD's Infinity Fabric. Other big changes to the young car was the addition of a higher level of cache, an L3 cache which sits outside of the car and is accessible by all cars. Also a big change that came is the memory controller was moved from the chipset onto the CPU die itself, which removed the chipset's latency and its interface's latency, thus speeding up memory accesses. This also reduced the bandwidth requirement to the chipset. This also had the effect of increasing the pin count on the CPU as a result of the memory interface now being on the CPU. Thus sockets went from 775 pins like on the car 2 to 1156 and 1366. Another lesser mentioned feature was the introduction of Intel's integrated graphics, although I'm not talking about them here. Other than these changes, as I said, the car stayed the same. There were no changes to the execution units, therefore IPC did not change. In 2011, Intel released what is largely remembered as their best iteration of the car architecture, the Sandy Bridge microarchitecture. The CPU got minor increases in IPC as a result of small improvements to the capabilities, width and complexity to the Sandy Bridge execution units, including the introduction of the AVX vector processing instruction. Other improvements came to the scheduler that feeds the units, although there were no more execution units added. One of the bigger notes of Sandy Bridge is that it reintroduced the decoded instruction cache from NetBurst, something that was missing in Carl 2 and Helm, as which I said in last video, can change the pipeline length. Further car development slowed with the release of Haswell Microarchitecture in 2013. Haswell was a major release for Intel in many ways. It was essentially the point where Intel admitted they could no longer keep manufacturing process technology going at the rate it had been, thus introducing the concept of refreshing today's microarchitectures, like how Skylake has been refreshed many times by now. But more importantly, it showed no technological improvements over Sandy Bridge. The pipeline was the same length, although there was another execution unit added and a port introduced, and the voltage controller was moved from the VRM controller to the CPU on car. After about two and a half years and a failed process shrink, leading to a Haswell refresh and a very short service life for Broadwell, Skylake was released. This is the microarchitecture iteration that is Intel's current standing microarchitecture right now. Skylake was one of the nicer forward movements. Again, another execution unit was introduced and support for DDFR was also introduced. It was also later here, with a HEDT refresh, that Intel introduced their replacement for the ring bus architecture to increase the car count in an attempt to combat AMD's Ryzen. This backfired massively, however, as the new mesh topology increased latency from car to car, increased on-car die size and increased power consumption. I'll there may be a closer look at this in another video. This also highlighted the Skylake car's unwillingness to overclock very high. Intel's car architecture CPUs have always had similar overclocking ceilings. The Core 2 CPU could go up to 4GHz on air or water. Sandy Bridge reached really the highest speeds, commonly hitting the upper side of 4GHz on air and water. Speeds dropped slightly with Haswell, despite the move from 32 to 22 nanometers manufacturing process. Maximum of clocks didn't change radically with Skylake until the KB Lake refresh where 5 GHz was now possible. That's a 1 GHz increase in overclock ceiling over the past 10 or 11 years, shifting from 60 nanometers to 14 nanometers. So let's answer the question from earlier. What caused the IPC gains? Well, from Car 2 to Skylake, there was an addition of two ALU slash FPUs. There was the addition of a VPU and then an AGU, but we're going to ignore the AGU. This took the total number of ALUs up from 3 to 4. That means that in a very linear flow or int workload, Skylake has about a 33% more bandwidth. This ends up translating to about 20% more work per clock actually being done for one reason or another when it comes to GPU pi. When it comes to a much less linear workload that taxes much more and has a more dynamic execution path, the other advances in the CPU development rarely stand out as in particularly Geekbench, which assesses most every part of the CPU. In this test, Skylake is just over twice as powerful clock for clock. The increase in memory bandwidth due to moving to DDR4 on die memory controllers and the addition of the other AGU really helps Skylake in Geekbench. As now not only does it help the ALUs and whatnot stay fed, but also memory accesses themselves are being benched on their own, thus adding more weight to the massive increases in per clock performance in this test. 
Also, the improvements to cache bandwidth, latency and hit rate have brought improvements to the per clock performance. So now we've been through the developments in the IPC war, what's next? Well, with a sudden introduction to an unexpectedly strong Ryzen in early to mid-2017, and with Intel still relying on Skylake, it looked like Intel didn't have all that many places to go. Their CPUs were faster in both IPC and clock speeds, however, their architecture was not about to change, and their clock speeds were really up against a wall. And with Ryzen beating Skylake's 4 cores in CPU bandwidth taxing applications, consumers turned to Ryzen as it had much better CPU throughput as long as all cores could be utilised as a result of up to 8 cores and 16 threads, twice that of what Intel offered at the same price, also at over 80% of Skylake's IPC and clock speeds. For Intel, the decision was clear. Increased core count for the first time in a decade, such that 6-core Skylake CPU could match an 8-core Ryzen CPU. This marked really the end of this era as we know it. By choosing Ryzen, the consumers have demonstrated that they are fully willing to buy lower IPC CPUs, even ones that have lower clocks. This demonstrates the end of the IPC war, as Intel struggled to increase IPC, and more and more applications are able to utilise the threads of a Ryzen CPU. The last nail in the coffin here was Intel's core count increase, and with rumours that Canon Lake will support even more cores on the mainstream platform, this marks the beginning of the core war.